Uh, welcome to Milano and the New School. My name is Neil Graboy, and I'm the Dean of the Milano School. And today's program is dedicated to the memory of Henry Cohen, the founding dean of our school. Dean Cohen's commitment to professionalism in urban government and to improving the social welfare of urban families are reflected in the accomplishments of thousands of our alumni and the extraordinary, in the extraordinary work of our current students. Henry Cohen held top posts in the Wagner and Lindsay administrations uh, before he came to the new school. Soon after he joined the university, he transformed a small civic interest program, then known as the Center for New York City Affairs, now it's a giant program, into the Graduate School of Management and Urban Policy. Today, both the Graduate School and the Center are flourishing, and both share Dean Cohen's passion for compassionate, effective government. In his honor, our annual Henry Cohen Lecture focuses on public policy challenges and solutions for women, children, and families, particularly in impoverished and working class urban settings. One of Dean Cohen's students from the early days of the school, Susan Halpern, today a member of the Graduate School's Board of Governors and the University's Board of Trustees. She's been a longstanding and strong supporter of the school and of the Center for New York City Affairs. Susan, I'm delighted you're here, but you're behind the post. I want to thank her for helping to keep Henry Cohen's spirit and legacy in focus, inspiring the Henry Cohen professorship, which is currently held by Peter Isinger. At Milano, we teach the skills that lie at the intersection of policy and implementation, skills that managers need to improve government, and we sure need that today, and other organizations in order to better serve communities and families in need. Our students take on real life problems in urban policy and management, and this school is as much about learning from experience as from lectures, readings, and seminars. It is in this spirit that we welcome tonight's speaker, Jared Bernstein, an economist and public intellectual with long experience in federal government and in the development of progressive public policy to support working families. Dr. Bernstein is a senior fellow at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities in Washington, D.C. Until last spring, he was chief economist and economic advisor to Vice President Joe Biden, executive director of the White House Task Force on the Middle Class, and a member of President Obama's economic team. Prior to joining the Obama administration, Dr. Bernstein was senior economist and director of the Living Standards Program at the Economic Policy Institute. And during the Clinton administration, he was deeply, he was deputy, deeply, yes, the deeply and deputy chief economist at the United States Department of Labor. We've invited him here today to discuss the economic and political outlook for working families and low-income families caught in the receding tide of the Great Recession. Unemployment in New York is below 9%, but in the Bronx, the official rate is 12%, and in Brooklyn, it's nearly 10%. Sadly, unemployment for young black and Latino men in this economy is far higher. What are the prospects for change? Do Congress and the White House have the ability or the willpower to do anything to improve the situation? Can the private sector revive itself? Some recent comments from a few economists suggest the possibility that continuing investments in manufacturing and long-term unemployment could well militate against any return to the traditional notions of full employment without a radical reconception of the role of government that might lead to job programs. We often speak in these public programs at Milano about the importance of reform and innovation in public policy. And it's true, innovative policies can reshape the way people experience government. But innovation in public policy is moot when policy, poli politics itself, I can't even gag out the word, when politics itself is at a standstill. 
I expect we'll all benefit from Dr. Bernstein's economic wisdom and his insight into the current state of our federal government. Following his talk, we'll have time for questions and answers and a brief panel discussion with our distinguished guest, Professor Dorian Warren of Columbia University and Milano's own Professor Jeff Smith. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jared Bernstein. Thank you, for that, thank you for that eloquent introduction. Um, how do I get my PowerPoint slides up here? Hit the arrow. There's four arrows. Wow, OK. Someone who knows how to do something. We now see the pragmatist in the room. Well, thank you for that, that great introduction. And, it, and you really um, forecasted many of my themes. I, and I, I wrote down this phrase the receding tide of the Great Recession. I think that's a great description of, of what's going on. Uh, I start from the perspective of the uh, question of how do we solve the economic dilemma, and I'll tell you what I think that dilemma is in a minute. Uh, you can't get there from here. I'm kind of reminded of the old, you work for Joe Biden, you learn some Irish jokes. Uh, I uh, remember the old uh, Irish joke uh, when someone asks, well, how would you stop a guy, a farmer on the road, well, how, how would you get to Kilkerny from here? And he says, well, I wouldn't start from here. Uh, and that's kind of uh, a little bit like uh, where we are right now. Uh, but I will, I will uh, tell you uh, where I think, uh, uh, how, how I think we can get there, uh, but it ain't from here. Uh, which, which leads me to uh, uh, make a comment about uh, where I am standing tonight, which is uh, at the New School. And I'm particularly gratified uh, to be here because I actually think um, the path forward in terms of public policy uh, starts from the kind of work that's been coming out of this institution, not over the last week or the last month, but over the last few decades. The heterodoxy in, in, in economic thinking here, the work of old friends, some of who are in the room. I've been worked with David Powell for years and Rick McGahee, and of course David Gordon was a, a huge influence. Um, uh, one of, uh, at the core of my, my argument, um, uh, Heather Boucher and a former graduate, Josh Bibbins, folks I've, I've worked with in the past, but at the core of my argument is that the mainstream dominant economic model um, uh, has uh, failed us uh, badly, and I've seen it uh, at work from the highest levels of government, uh, and uh, I, I see no reason to believe it won't continue to fail us badly. So I actually thought that the Dean's introduction and his kind of tilting towards uh, what he called a radical rethinking um, is, is, is relevant. Um, these are not radical times, <laughs> need I tell you. I mean, much of the radicalism I hear is coming from the far right. Um, uh, and so uh, I'm not talking about, I'm not necessarily referring to a set of changes that are, are going to happen in a, in a week or a day. Uh, you won't hear me say much about the super committee tonight, uh, uh, um, although I'm happy to talk about that during current events. But I think the, uh, I will talk a little bit about where we're jammed in the current dysfunctional period. But I think we have to get uh, well past that. So um, let me say that I'm going, to, I'm going to really try to make two points tonight. Um, they say when you uh, you know, expert is, is someone who comes from more than 50 miles away, wears a tie, and makes three points. But I'm going to make two points. Um, I'm deeply skeptical that we can meet the challenges uh, we face uh, uh, based on the current model. So I'll say more about that in a minute. Um, I think, uh, point two, I think we need a new model, and I'm happy to be here at the new school talking about new models, because I know that's, that's uh, uh, at the heart of your thinking. And this new model has to be built on two societal functions that have been um, horribly unmet. And, I, uh, uh, one is, and, and th those, those functions are opportunity and accountability. Uh, this new model has to have at its core the recognition of market failure that goes way beyond the general neoclassical economic assumptions of market failure, that is, ways in which markets don't work that all economists generally agree upon. If somebody's a polluter, they're not typically facing the price of the damage that they're, that they're doing. And so most economists agree that you could um, uh, try to uh, internalize that price, make somebody pay for their, their actions in that regard. That's kind of widely acceptable market, uh, uh, market failure. I, I consider that to be nibbling around the edges. Uh, from my perspective, markets have uh, uh, failed quite dramatically over the past uh, decade in particular in terms of the quantity and the quality of jobs. The quantity is a very important piece of this. Um, it, it's been an assumption among economists, even progressive economists for years, that 
you, we do have to worry about the quality of jobs. It's sort of left to its own devices that uh, uh, the economy will generate uh, maybe not enough jobs to get us at full employment, but enough jobs to get us within spitting distance. Uh, that did not happen uh, over the past decade. So the market has failed both in terms of job quantity and job quality, in terms of mobility, in terms of economic inequality, in terms of insufficient public investment, in terms of uh, uh, effective enough countercyclical policy, and in terms of regulating uh, unstable sectors of the economy, particularly uh, uh, financial markets, that uh, um, uh, can obviously uh, uh, have uh, tremendously negative effects uh, long term uh, on the economy. But I'm not just going to talk about market failure. I, I think in some ways one of the more important pieces of this discussion, particularly in, in the Milano School, is to, is to think about government failure. People like me used to walk around, and probably maybe some of you as well, thinking, um, well, we should, we, you know, the government should do X. The government should fix this. The government should fix that. We should invest in infrastructure. We should have a higher minimum wage. We should have more progressive tax policy, we should do a lot of things. Well, spending a few years working for uh, uh, the administration, working for, for the government during the heart of the Great Depression has led me to be much more worried about the actual ability of government as it's structured today to carry out uh, the challenge, to meet the challenges that it faces, and to carry out uh, the, the um, functions that we desperately need it to carry out. And there's a real political dimension to this. I, I was introduced as an economist, and I uh, proudly wear that label, but I really think of myself as a political economist. And uh, one of the problems we face right now, I'll say a little bit more about this in the context of my comments, is that um, there are large swaths of elected officials who very much disbelieve in the role of government the way I believe, the way I think many of you, certainly the way the dean believes in, in his introduction, the role of government that I would argue that a school like Milano really stands for, a government that's amply funded and able to efficiently meet the challenges of an advanced economy in, in the 21st century. There are lots of people who are uh, uh, running for office and in office who very fundamentally disbelieve that there's a, uh, a role uh, for government like that. And, 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 and one, of, one of the things they'll tell you is that government is inefficient and ineffective in playing that role. And if you elect them, damn it, they'll prove it to you. <laughs> and this is a fundamental conundrum. Uh, there are, you know, many of our leaders uh, believe government works very badly, and they're working very hard to prove it to all of us just how badly it works. Um, that actually captures kind of my first bullet. Obviously, in the near term, we have a dysfunctional Congress. I think this is obvious. I'm happy to defend this assertion uh, if anyone wants to, to ask. But um, the way I view it is, is, is an inability to self-correct. One of the things you need a public sector to do at a time like this is to, um, and I'm sorry to those who are, uh, I'm, I'm standing in my back to, um, but one of the things you, you, you need is, um, is the ability to, to, to uh, uh, effectively diagnose and prescribe, to understand the problems you face and to prescribe solutions for them. Um, we clearly have lost that ability. The uh, federal government in particular um, is uh, unable to self-correct. And any system that cannot self-correct, whether it's a biological system or a political system, will die. So that's something we have to kind of work out. Um, what about the reaction to the Great Recession? Well. You know, I was there, I was part of it, I'm proud of the work that we did in the Obama administration that helped to break the back of the, of the Great Recession, pull GDP growth forward. Uh, the uh, Keynesian stimulus that was the Recovery Act was uh, very effective in doing what we wanted and needed it to do. It needed to be larger and last longer, that's true. Um, but I think fundamentally that was a, an effective program. Uh, yet, it's hard to feel, it's hard to shake the feeling that we missed an opportunity uh, in, in the following sense. Let me, let me actually jump ahead a little bit, a lot bit. There are, when I say that I'm deeply skeptical of the current economic model, um, 
you might well wonder, well, what is that current economical, uh, economic model about which I'm deeply skeptical? Um, what I'm, I, I'm going to take you through quickly uh, what I think comprises that way of thinking, that model. But the point right here that I want to make at this point in my conversation with you is I think we had an opportunity to recognize that the highest level of policy that this model was a failed model and to implement a new one. And uh, it, that opportunity, I, I don't think we availed ourselves of that opportunity enough. Um, I'll say a little bit more about that uh, later. And it, it was not the fault uh, of, of the administration or the president. I think he actually understands this. Uh, but um, uh, politics has been extremely hostile to um, uh, moving in the direction we need to move. So what do I mean when I say the current economic model has failed us? By the way, that should be rational, not rationale. Um, markets, uh, the, 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 these, are the, these are the bones of the current way, I think, policymakers, whether they know it or not, think about the economy. Markets self-regulate. Uh, there's a school of economic thought called rational expectations or uh, efficiency market theories, and, and, and the uh, idea here is that private markets by themselves police themselves, they regulate themselves. Once you have uh, a, a, a private e a sector economy up and running, um, prices communicate all the signals that consumers and people and workers need to receive in order to make the optimally efficient decisions such that the economy will do uh, uh, perfectly well. Um, the uh, uh, regulation or public policy that um, gets in the way of this kind of invisible hand of the type that uh, Adam Smith talked about um, can only screw things up uh, because uh, the, the ability of the market itself to self-regulate, to police itself, to send all the right signals that people need to make the right choices, um, that signal gets jammed when public policy gets in the mix with unions and minimum wages and progressive taxes and, and counter-cyclical policy, et cetera. And so it's, it's, it's very much an anti-government, pro-market uh, way of thinking. And uh, this is a, a, a dominant uh, school of uh, economic thought uh, that continues to um, uh, prevail among many in the profession. Not all, but many. So you marry that up. You marry that anti-government, efficient market hypothesis up with this, this idea of trickle-down supply-side economics. And you leaven this very heavily with campaign finance. And you end up with a very toxic brew. Trickle-down supply-side economics is the notion that if you simply uh, cut uh, taxes and you deregulate, cut taxes particularly for those at the very top of the income scale, and you deregulate so that uh, because markets police themselves anyway, so what's the point of regulation, then um, uh, you will unleash, again, the invisible hand will be, uh, the handcuffs will come off the invisible hand. and. Uh, the deregulated, now uh, um, uh, uh, no longer overtaxed uh, uh, folks at the, at, the, at the high end of the income scale will create enough economic activity that will trickle down and lead to uh, better economic results uh, for everyone. Um, now, sometimes the invisible hand is all thumbs, and we'll talk about that, but the uh, model doesn't allow that. Um, we don't pick winners. This is another part of the common uh, thinking that that uh, that of, of the of the of the dominant model. The idea that the, the 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 public sector can't favor particular sectors. Can't say it would be smart to have a manufacturing policy. It would be smart to have uh, a, a policy that favors. Um, uh, clean energy. Uh, it would be smart to have a policy that uh, um, uh, prices carbon or uh, other uh, pollutants. Um, that would be picking winners, and that would fly in the face of market self-regulation and the notion that markets know best and will make the best decisions on their own. We can neither spot nor deflate bubbles. All right? This one is actually kind of maybe fading a little bit. Ben Bernanke, chair uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve recently said, no, maybe we ought to think a little bit harder about that one. But it was, it was certainly the po uh, policy of the Federal Reserve under Alan Greenspan that while bubbles might develop, that these are speculative bubbles, the idea that some asset, uh, the price of some asset becomes inflated well beyond its actual uh, value in a kind of a natural market or supply demand framework. So housing, there was a housing bubble. Before that, there was a dot-com bubble. 
But uh, if the, if the uh, uh, central bank authorities or the uh, federal government uh, believes they can neither spot nor deflate bubbles, um, you know, you take that, you take that kind of, uh, of uh, a, a critical function off the table, that's also part of the current model that's got to go. Um, the favoring of small versus large businesses uh, it brings considerable distortion to the system. This is very much a political thing. You know, you can't avoid hearing a politician talk about how much they love small business. And there are definitely certain constraints that small businesses face that we should help them with. But the idea that small businesses deserve uh, a level of distortion that we have in some of our policies to help them is, 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 is not helpful. Um, uh, this last one refers to, I mean, this next one, mercantilists must be quietly nudged until they realize the errors of their ways. Now, this is the idea that there are those who, um, uh, countries uh, with whom we compete in international markets that manage their currency in such a way as to give them a, an edge in, uh, in globalization. Um, and uh, the uh, mainstream model has a kind of doctrine of not really doing much about that. And I think that's problem problematic, too. Um, I'll come back to the, to the latter two. So I just wanted to tell you when I say, you know, what is the dilemma? Um, uh, uh, what is it that, you know, I, I argue that, we missed, uh, that, that we've missed so far an opportunity to do something about? That's what it is. All of the things I described to you so far, with maybe the exception of the we can't spot or deflate bubbles, are actually still quite dominant in the thinking of, uh, of policymakers. And that's um, extremely problematic. I mean, if we follow the same model that I just described, we continue to, to, to go down that road, we will be back where we are, you know, very, you know, way too soon. In fact, we may be in some ways back there already if you look at some of the things that are going on. A couple of weeks ago, a hedge fund by the name of MF Global uh, went bankrupt, collapsed. This was a hedge fund that was leveraged 44 to 1 betting on discounted Southern European sovereign debt. Now, this number 44 to 1, that may not mean something. Historically, it was considered really pretty outside the box if you're, if you're leveraged, meaning that you're, um, the amount of capital that you as a bank borrowed relative to what you uh, had on your books, relative to you know, your, your, how, how much you borrowed rather, uh, relative to how much you held, how much to your equity, sort of debt to equity is a good way to think of it. Um, if you were at 20 to 1, you were like way playing it fast and loose. And I think Lehman might have been 30 or something like that. So this is after the crash. This is, you know, weeks ago. Leverage 44 to 1. I ran into Brooksley Bourne. Do people know the name Brooksley Bourne? Yeah, Brooksley Bourne was a, um, a regulator uh, in the 90s uh, in the, uh, in, who worked for one of the regulatory agencies. Uh, for the federal government, and she tried to regulate derivatives and was kind of pushed back by, you know, the big boys in the room. And I ran into her the other day, at, right after this MF thing, and I said, you know, Brooksley, have we learned nothing? And, uh, and we kind of concluded that there is a risk of, having, of, 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 of exactly that. So I'm, I'm just saying that if we, if we don't recognize the uh, um, inadequacy of the model I just described, We've, we're going to continue to fall into the same traps. Um, market failures, more pervasive than commonly recognized in the dominant model. I mentioned these factors here. Uh, you know, this bubble bust repeat sequence that we keep having is another um, function of, I think, the, uh, of, of, the dominant, of the dominant model. Um, and then a theme of mine that I want to try to explore uh, for a moment is um, the misunderstanding and the misuse of debt. That's just an, another, another uh, part of, I think, the current uh, uh, model. Um, but let me, you know, so far I've asserted, I've asserted that, um, that the, the, the last 10 years, really the decade of the 2000s, um, was a lost decade. I've asserted that. And I, I've, ass I've asserted that based on, um, so far, um, uh, economic uh, uh, theory of an insufficient model based on wrong-headed thinking about how economies actually work in an advanced economy. But what about evidence? How about some numbers? I mean, that's, I'm a, I, I'm a card-carrying quantitative economist, and I, I, I always start from the numbers. So everything I'm telling you is based on a set of um, actual empirical observations of stuff that's gone wrong in the economy, particularly over the last uh, uh, a decade, but uh, going back further, uh, if we're talking about problems like inequality. This is a picture of median income, so the 50th percentile, middle class income, for working age households. 
uh, over the last uh, 20 plus years. Um, and it really is a contrast in two, in two decades, the 90s and the 2000s. In the 90s, what you see there is that middle income, working age households, and you take the retirees out of there because at the heart of this is a labor market story. So, so you want to look at working age households. And uh, in, in the 90s, we had a, we had, we had a, a recession, 1991, uh, and uh, uh, you see that their income fell, as it often does, in a downturn. But then as the economy started um, growing again, and, uh, jobs were being added, the unemployment rate started coming down, their income grew 10 percent. They went from about 54,000 up to around 62,000. Uh, so uh, very much what you would expect over the course of an economic recovery. You, have a, uh, you lose some ground in the downturn, and then you gain, gain it back and more. And you can see that from, if you go from sort of one economic peak to another, they had uh, a decent run there. But look what happens in the 2000s. Uh, their uh, income begins to fall in the recession of, of uh, 2001, and it never really starts growing. Uh, you got a little tick up there towards the end of the decade, but this was the first economic expansion on record where middle-income families were actually worse off in real terms at the end of the thing than they were at the beginning. And then in the recession, the Great Recession, well, then they fell off a cliff and have continued to fall. Uh, what the heck happened? Well, this is part of a longer trend. Now, this takes, this takes a look at real median family incomes in the U.S. Uh, going back all the way to 1947, and it documents something that's uh, uh, important and well-known to uh, scholars who look at this stuff, which is that post-mid-70s, you actually had a significant deceleration in the growth of family income. Uh, it, it was growing at one-fourth as fast per year in the latter period relative to the earlier period. And if you line this up next to productivity, so one thing that you like to kind of think about as an economist is how are the, uh, how's the middle class or the typical worker faring relative to overall economic growth, relative to the growth in, in productivity. Now, productivity is a measure of output per hour. If we're more productive, it means we're creating more output for a given number of hours of work. And you can pretty easily imagine, and that's a mantra among economists, that as productivity rises, living standards rise. Because we're, uh, um, uh, if we uh, are creating more output per hour of work, we ought to be able to afford people with the possibility of better living standards. And somewhat amazingly, I mean, there's no reason why median family income should grow in lockstep with productivity, but it did. From 47 to 73, they both grew at about 3% per year. I mean, those bars are, are equal. Um, uh, in the uh, ensuing period, though, in this, this period from uh, 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 73 to 2007, uh, you see a, uh, a huge divergence between productivity growth, which, kept, which basically kept on growing at a good clip. I mean, people like to think that productivity decelerated in the U United States past the mid-'70s, and it did for a while, but it picked up pace again in the latter years. And so this is a picture of income inequality. This is a picture of an economy that's growing while the middle class is treading water. And uh, if you want to see a, a picture of that, this is the kind of, these are the kind of numbers that, um, motivate, I think, the Occupy Wall Street thinking around, you know, 99-1. Uh, the, 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 the top 1 percent says 275. It's actually 277. Um, the top 1 percent, this is after tax income, so after you take out the impact of taxes. This is CBO data, by the way, Congressional Budget Office. I mean, considered the kind of official scorekeeper of such things where I live. Um, you can see, you know, the, 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 how well you did was a function of what income group you started out in. And if you're in the bottom quintile over this, over this 28 year period, you know, you got, you got, you got 18, uh, 18%. If you're in the middle, 35. If you're in the top, 277. So this kind of a picture, there is growth, but it's doing an end run around the middle class. You know, for whom, as Paul Krugman puts it, economic growth has been a spectator sport. Now, how the heck could this happen? Um, uh, and I'm particularly thinking about this. Let, let's, let's narrow in and look at the 2000s. Because to me, and when I talk about this potential of missing an opportunity to throw out uh, a not only um, 
not, not only intellectually unsound, but a deeply damaging economic model and bring in a new one, there's no better set of indicators, statistics, examples than what went on in the 2000s. So I'm going to talk about this decade as a microcosm of, uh, of, of why the dominant model is wrong and why we need a new one. Um, I showed you the income results. Um, but look at the, but this, this is something uh, uh, even I'll bet some of the scholars here may, may, not, may not be uh, aware of. And by the way, this graph is very, this is not econometric. This takes three, three seconds to make if you have a decent internet connection. It's just, uh, just job growth from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Every single decade, and this is, this is done so that you're kind of going economic peak to peak. Uh, which is what you want to do, so you kind of extract out the impact of recession. Every single economic decade from the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, every single economic decade, we added 20 to 30 percent on jobs. If you take just the, ni uh, uh, take the 90s just as an example to attach some numbers to this, during the 90s, I think we added about 28 million jobs. During the 2000 business cycle expansion, which was 00 to 07, uh, we added about 5 million jobs. 4%, 4% job growth over that period. And then you fall off a cliff and you lose 6%, 2007 to 2010. What the heck happened? <laughs> well, they're in here. It's my last bullet. Uh, but I don't think that's uh, hardly, hardly the story at all. I mean, it's part of the story, but I don't think it's even the big part. Um, If this is the new normal, then we're very deeply screwed. Uh, and you know, I, 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 don't think, uh, I don't think it is. I think we made a lot of mistakes, and I think we can correct them. Now, some of them, as particularly this first one, um, is not necessarily an obvious uh, policy mistake or policy advantage. It's just. Um, the impact of labor saving technology, which appears to have accelerated. So forever, you know, if you go back to Malthus, economists worried that as, as, as we became more productive, this is also the Luddites, as we became more productive, as we, remember, productivity output per hour, as we were able to create more output and fewer hours of work, um, we would be putting more people out of work. And this was always kind of a fallacy in economics, because if you actually look at going back to the 1940s, if you actually look at the trajectory of productivity and job growth, they actually grow together. So yes, we were becoming more technologically adept. We were adding computers, or go back far enough, we were adding railroads, and then transistors, and then lasers, and then computers, and, uh, uh, and, 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 and so on. You actually have productivity and job growth kind of really hugging each other until you get to the 2000s. And then you see they really separate. So what we had was an acceleration of productivity growth, but a deceleration, a slower growth of employment. So there may have been an acceleration of labor-saving technology, which we have to be mindful of, I think particularly in manufacturing. It's one of the reasons why I'm a, uh, I'm a large, I was going to say I'm a loud, I'm a large and loud advocate of, um, of, of activist manufacturing policy uh, a la some other advanced economies, Germany comes to mind. But I don't believe that that's going to close the employment gap in large part because of the advances in labor-saving technology in the sector, particularly robotics. Increased import penetration from China. This is just a graph of the import penetration ratio. It's, uh, it's uh, imports over GDP um, uh, from, uh, from China. Uh, in 2001, China joined the WT, uh, WTO, and their uh, imports to the U.S. accelerated uh, quickly. There's a, a new, very authoritative study on this that argues that uh, almost 60 percent of the manufacturing job loss in the 2000s, which was significant, came from this uh, factor. Um, now, uh, this is one of my personal favorites, uh, allocative inefficiency. It's probably not the most elegant way to say it. but. Um, uh, I think it's really important, and it's more theoretical, although I actually think Marx wrote about something like this uh, uh, a long time ago. Um, one of the things we did in the 1990s was allocate, I'm sorry, in the 2000s, in this, in this period of, 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 of such problematic growth, one of the things we did was allocate too many productive resources to unproductive sectors. You had Lots of people using lots of capital, highly skilled people, trying to figure out 
how to arbitrage a minuscule price difference in a share of equity from one second to the next. And you know, this was, this was how you could make big money if you were able to arbitrage that price inefficiency out quicker than uh, the person sitting you know, across Wall Street from you in a different firm. Uh, your firm could make you know, huge money. This, this just shifts money around at the top of the, of the scale. This is, this is extremely inefficient from the perspective of job creation, of broadly shared income growth, from the perspective of a middle class that's kind of pulled along with the rest of the economy's growth. So I believe we allocated resources inefficiently in those years. And in fact, I think the evidence is that it, uh, it, uh, the, the uh, inefficiency led to a very destructive bubble in housing and finance. Look, inequality itself and, and, and lousy income growth from the middle class uh, is part of the problem. It's a feedback loop. One of the things that Larry Michelle, former co-author of mine, uh, uh, and I used to write about in the 90s during that period of strong income growth. Remember this, this strong uptick in, in median family income in the 90s, and, and low income and poverty did well in those years as well. Um, one of the things we, uh, we uh, uh, talked about was um, uh, wage-led demand growth. Wage-led demand growth. That is, if it, it, you can run an economy on a locative inefficiency delivering all of the growth to the top 1%. Because guess what? Those people, they spend the money. And you know, it isn't just like you know, about buying one Rolex. Um, uh, uh, the, the, there, there's evidence that you can actually, uh, you know, that, that the economy can't, can, well, I think the, the economy did grow. GDP grew in the 2000s. But when you allocate inefficiently and all of the growth accumulates at the top, um, it's a very different kind of recovery than when you have more broadly shared growth, wage-led demand growth. It's not just people shopping at what we call Nordstrom's. I don't know if you have that up here. You know, it's not just folks shopping at, at, at high-end uh, um, places. It's activity all throughout the economy. It's investment all throughout the economy. It's, it's the bodega on the corner expanding along with uh, uh, you know, the high-end the high retailer. Um, Wage-led demand growth leads to longer recoveries. Remember, this recovery in the, short, in the 2000s was a short one. And yes, as someone called out from the audience, lousy fiscal policy uh, is part of this as well, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to get to that in a second. Um, I want to try to uh, go a little quicker here because I want to make sure we have time for my panel, fellow panelists to jump in. In fact, let me just, um, let me just uh, uh, go through this, and then I'll, then I'll, then I'll conclude and stop. Um, I talked to you in some detail about how you can't get there from here. You can't craft the economic model. You can't, you can't uh, generate the broadly shared prosperity, the allocative efficiency, uh, the uh, growth of sectors that uh, are going to be critically important for market share, like clean energy, if you subscribe to all of these wrong-headed notions on this page. Well, there's a fiscal dimension to this. And you can't get there from here either if we're going to be wedded to this wrong-headed thinking about government fiscal policy. And this, to me, is the argument of the next 12 months, the role and the size of government. Government, so, so these are a, a whole other set of wrong-headed thoughts that I believe are, are key to the dominant model. Government is the problem. Yo-yo economics, that's, that's you're on your own. Uh, the idea that, that government is the problem and all we need to do, listen to Paul Ryan, Representative Paul Ryan, all we need to do is privatize, voucherize, you know, shrink government, cut taxes. Government itself is the problem. Totally consistent with market self-regulating, get government out of the way. A balanced budget amendment. You've heard this argument lately, we should have a balanced budget amendment. It's a thinly veiled trick to, to, to shrink uh, 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 the size of government until it's unable to meet the functions we need it to be. This is not an argument for large government. This is an argument for efficient government, the argument I mean. Government failure as a self-fulfilling prophecy. I told you about that earlier. The idea that, you know, I believe government doesn't work. Elect me and I will prove it. Um, uh, the idea that taxes can only be lowered. A dominant, dominant, dominant view in my world. I mean, I live through this this everyday regress, regressive taxation. I mean, look at the look at the tax proposals of the uh, of the folks running for Republican office. I mean, some of them are downright um, a lot. I mean, I just don't know what to make of them. I mean, um, Herman Cain, 
I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about Mr. Cain, but Herman Cain has a plan that raises taxes on the bottom 80% of households to cut them massively at the top. I don't get why anybody, even the Tea Party, would support that. So, you know, this thing is really turning, it's like a snake eating itself at this point. Um, favoring different types of income, I think this is, this is a mistake that we make in, in fiscal policy. Uh, our budget process, and I'm thinking of capital gains and dividends. I can come back to this. I'm going to breeze through this part a little bit. But this part I want to stick on for a second. Our budget process is totally non-transparent. I challenge any voter, any voter to know what the heck we're talking about when we have these arguments about the magnitude of the budget deficit. I mean, if you're even trying to pay attention, all the business about budget baselines and um, how much one plan cuts relative to another plan, nobody can figure it out. I mean, most of the politicians, I don't believe, can figure it out. So uh, we need to get to a budget process that's more understandable to people. Um, we can't get there from here if we're going to lose uh, counter-cyclicality. Uh, I don't care how great your economic model is, you're going to hit hiccups. And um, the idea right now very dominant. I just came back from Europe where this is even worse. The idea right now that um, the way to actually grow the economy in a period where the private sector remains down on the mat is to, is, is to actually uh, uh, do less stimulus. The idea of Keynesian uh, economics being in such disrepute is um, extremely wrong-headed. And it's really being hijacked by the same folks who simply want there to be less government for ideological reasons. It's not that they genuinely believe that contraction, contractionary fiscal policy is really expansionary. It really will help the economy grow. It's just tacking on the ideological agenda uh, onto a growth agenda in a complete Alice in Wonderland context. Um, and then uh, misunderstanding of deficits and debt. We, we there, there, there are some, there, there are some very serious ways in which we get this wrong. I'm just going to talk about two here. I can get back to them in Q&A if you want. One thing, look at the third bullet, time horizons. Um, it, our budget deficit as a share of GDP is something like around 8 or 9% right now. It's very high. We'd like it to be, uh, once the economy starts growing, 3% or lower. That's called primary balance. But the, the budget deficit as a share of GDP is definitely too high. Uh, uh, it, 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 if these were normal times with an economy percolating along and the private sector doing its thing. Given the fact that that's not where we are, I'd actually argue that the question isn't, is your budget deficit too large? It's, is it large enough? Is your budget deficit large enough to actually help you get through this period where the private sector isn't contributing much to growth at all? Um, and the answer is it's too small. We're not doing enough to stimulate the economy. But doesn't, that, but doesn't that just fly in the face of, of, of this concern about long-term budget deficits? It's a totally legitimate concern. Over the long term, you absolutely have to pay for what you spend. Um, uh, 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 and the answer is no. And the reason it's no is because temporary spending, temporary spending has uh, almost no impact on the budget deficit at all. What really matters for the budget deficit is long-term stuff, and the Bush tax cuts, you mentioned bad fiscal policy, the Bush tax cuts are the prime example. Look at this graph. This graph shows all of the factors that are driving the budget deficit over the next decade. If you took out all of these factors, you'd be looking at that little black line bumping along the bottom and there'd be no budget deficit. But it decomposes the factors into their different components. And the thing I want to point out to you is that the Recovery Act, and associated measures, 800 plus billion dollars of Keynesian stimulus got into the system and got out. It's adding uh, almost nothing to the budget deficit. By next year, it's going to be well under half a percent of the budget deficit as a share of GDP, and it's going to be co contributing absolutely nothing to the growth of the debt by next year. So temporary measures don't hurt you. And these stimulative measures are temporary. We have this all wrong. The Bush tax cuts, you can see, just keep giving and giving. Uh, so uh, that, that's one thing. Now, part of this is our own fault. We have def defended Keynesianism badly. We've bought into the notion that uh, everybody wants us to cut spending, that austerity is the flavor of the week. And part of this is goosed by what I think of as the worst analogy ever, which goes like this. Hey, families have to tighten their belts in hard times, and so the government has to tighten its belt too. 
That is the worst analogy ever. One of the reasons it's so bad is because it sounds so folksy and true and it sort of makes sense, but it's upside down. When, when families can't run budget deficits, governments can. I mean, when, 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 when families are tightening their belts, that's when the federal government has to loosen its belt. States can't do it. States have to balance their budget every year. So this analogy has been uh, extremely destructive. When families, by the way, are back on track and they're loosening their belts, they're spending more freely and borrowing again, that's when we have to bring that budget deficit down. I'm very much against structural budget deficits. I was very elated by the surpluses at the end of 2000. A structural budget deficit is a budget deficit you have even when the economy is at, at full employment and growing apace. You still have a budget deficit. You shouldn't, you shouldn't have a, a growing budget deficit at that point. At that point, the budget deficit should be coming down. There's a lot of things we do well. I, I don't want to leave here without, uh, you know, a little patriotic uh, section. Um, a lot of things we do well. We have flexible capital and product markets, highly productive. Actually, while we've done a lot to hurt our counter-cyclicality in ways I can show you, some of the stuff we're doing is, is really quite effective in poverty reduction. Unemployment insurance in 2010 kept three million people out of poverty, including a million kids. The earned income tax credit kept five and a half million people out of poverty, including three million kids. Food stamps, four million people, including 1.7 million kids, all kept out of poverty by, um, by uh, countercyclical measures. On the other hand, welfare reform uh, is not working. Welfare reform is a fair weather ship. It actually works okay when the economy is at full employment, which it hasn't been since a New York Minute back in the latter 1990s. And so TANF, which is the new name for welfare, uh, has been uh, quite ineffective in meeting the demands of the, of the Great Recession. Um, I think the Federal Reserve is doing a pretty good job. I'd actually say more than a pretty good job. Um, we were late to the game, but we hit, hit back hard against the market failure in the Great Recession. And finally, I sense, maybe it's because I'm now a blogger, it's kind of my obsession, um, you know, I sense there's a growing interest in what's really going on. I think all the things I've talked to you about tonight, and I'm about to wind down, all the things I've talked to you about tonight, I go around the country giving this kind of a rap, not quite this erudite, because I'm, you know, here talking at the new school. But um, I, I go around the country talking about this stuff, and, and, and I got to tell you, people really want to hear, not necessarily my message, and I can't vouch for that, people want to hear if, why, and what is an alternative way to think about the economy, an alternative model, a different way of thinking. People just don't want to believe that this is the new normal um, and you know, they sh that this, this 4% at the end, followed by a negative 6%, this lost decade is a new normal. They, simply, they sure don't want to believe that, uh, uh, that, uh, that this is the new normal with all the growth uh, uh, eluding uh, folks at the bottom. So. You can't get there from here, but you can get there from where I think we need to go. Look, I've offered, I think, some thoughts about a new economic model. For years, I worked at the Economic Policy Institute. For years, I've worked with people here at the New School. You know, frankly, folks, I think if we turned around and looked behind us, we'd find all too few people marching in our parade uh, for the most part. That feels like it's changing. Now, part of it is the Occupy Wall Street movement with this emphasis on the absence of opportunity and accountability. The Occupy Wall Street movement, I'll have to see what it morphs into, and I'm not saying, you know, I'm not saying I'm an expert on it. I'm not. I'm not saying I endorse it. I don't know enough about, about that. All I can say is that I've been trying to start this conversation for 25 years, and these folks have started it in two months. And that's an amazing thing. We. We need, as I've stressed, a model against the new normal that recognizes the market failures that you see elaborated here. The trickle down that I keep hearing is completely uh, uh, um, uh, disproved as a, an economic model that benefits anyone except those at the very top of the scale. We are underinvesting in the public. We are in danger of, uh, of losing countercyclical counter policy or, or um, policies that would engender full employment. Clearly, I am an advocate of a, a new model based on these, on these insights. I'm not exactly sure 
what that is yet in any granular sense, but I think I'm pretty sure about the architecture, the framework of it. I think there are uh, 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 historically um, places like the New School, the Milano School in particular, have, have generated interest, concern, academic rigor on precisely this kind of thinking. And for years it felt like we were in the wilderness with no one really listening to the uh, alarm bells that we were ringing about this stuff. That shouldn't be the case anymore. So if you work with me, I'll work with you and we'll figure this out together. Thanks very much. Good evening. Uh, I'm Jeff Smith, uh, Assistant Professor of Politics and Advocacy here at the Milano School. Um, first, I'd like to open by uh, thanking Dr. Bernstein for an extraordinarily insightful presentation. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I wish that uh, the 300 million Americans not in this room could see some of those graphs. Um, uh, maybe they were live streaming it online, I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> I hope so. Also happy to have here uh, Professor Dorian Warren, who is uh, Assistant Professor of International and Public Affairs at Columbia. In the truest sense of, of uh, the words that Dean Graboy described, Professor Warren is a public intellectual. Not only has he published uh, extensively in academic journals, but his most recent publication in the Washington Post compared the occupiers uh, at Zuccotti Park to the locked out NBA stars. So. <laughs> wonderful, <laughs> wonderful to have you here, Professor Warren. Um, well, I'd like to start uh, by talking just a little bit uh, with, with both of you about the Occupy Wall Street movement. I know it's something that's uh, been very much on my students' minds, uh, as I imagine it has yours as well, and, and the whole world, really. Um, do you all, you know, what's your assessment of the political implications uh, of this movement? You, you, you used a word, you know, morphs. What will it morph into, uh, Dr. Bernstein? And what do you see it morphing into? Um, let me just be very brief, because I really want to hear what Dorian has to say about this more than what I have to say about it. Um, uh, I had a long interview with someone from uh, the movement the other night from OWS. They, they have a website where they interview uh, people, and uh, a number, they've interviewed a number of pro progressive economists, including our own Jeff Madrick, who I uh, saw here earlier. Um, and, and, and it was an hour-long interview, and the last third of it I interviewed her. Uh, mm. So I, I know a little bit more about the answer to your question now. To me, the question is, um, uh, people have asked me, you know, to what extent is, is Occupy Wall Street kind of like the other end of the continuum from the Tea Party? And uh, my, my, my answer was, well, I mean, they're, they're quite different in the sense that the Tea Party has, has, has real political power. The Tea Party has convinced politicians, rightly or wrongly, and I think it's probably rightly, that they can elect you or unelect you. And that gives them a tremendous amount of power and clout. So the question I have in my mind is, is OWS moving in a political direction? Um, are, are, are they going to channel their, um, uh, uh, their energy, their views, their analysis into um, political activism? And uh, my sense from talking to some, now nobody represents the movement, so I'm not saying, and so the answer is X, but my sense is that uh, many in the movement want that to happen, and, and I think that's a good thing. Professor Warren? So there, there's so much to say about Occupy Wall Street, um, but, but just a couple of examples of how we might think about where the movement can go and its influence in politics. So one thing social movements do is to set the agenda or reshape the agenda, the political agenda. They insert issues into the national political discourse that otherwise wouldn't get on the policy agenda. So for instance, if you look at the coverage in the newspapers before September 17th and after September 17th, and you do a word search on the words inequality or greed or top 1%, you see this before September 17th and then you see that. So already, what, what, what Jared said, he's been working on these issues for 25 years, but the conversation has shifted in two months. That's serious, and that's real. And the question is, well, what, what can sustain that, that kind of change in political discourse? So that, that's one way in which the movement is already won, and it's only two months old. In some ways, I don't, I'm not sure it matters if Occupy Wall Street itself decides to channel 
itself in the political system, because I think there are lots of other political organizations that will do that already. The labor movement is gonna pick up the steam from Occupy Wall Street and make the case in DC. Liberal and progressive groups like Move On, they're gonna do that already. So the energy from Occupy Wall Street, in some ways I, would, I don't want them to focus on electoral politics or getting involved into the political cycle. I want them to keep shaping the broader debate and agenda and let other groups who have been working on these issues fill in the gaps with that extra push, with that extra win from Occupy sales. Um, let me just delve a little bit deeper into this. Uh, one of the public policies that I think animated the Tea Party um, at, its, uh, at its beginning was an opposition to crony capitalism, to the Wall Street bailouts, um, which is you know, precisely what, what Occupy Wall Street has been about. Now, since then, because of the Koch brothers and, and other uh, elements, the movement, the Tea Party movement has been, I think, co-opted, many would argue. However, the germ you know, uh, of the movement was in many ways similar to, to what we see you know, with the occupiers around the country. Is there any way to disentangle the cultural shreds of the two movements, the, the significant differences on immigration or other you know, cultural and unite a party around a sort of, we are the 99% slogan? And would the nomination of a Mitt Romney, who sort of embodies the you know, deregulatory you know, uh, corporatism of, you know, of, uh, that, that you described, Professor Bernstein, mm -hmm. could that catalyze such a unity across the ideological spectrum? You know, I'm skeptical. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great question, Jeff, and it's in, and really interesting. And you're absolutely right. There's, um, but I, you know, there, I think all populist movements share um, that, that mm -hmm. characteristic, uh, particularly around accountability vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, you know, rich folks who screwed everything up and, you know, not, and, and, and got bailed out and are doing, you know, much better now while everybody else is still struggling. You know, I, I, I can, the statistics on this are kind of, uh, 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 you know, amazing and underappreciated. Corporate profits as a share of GDP has not only recovered from its stellar pre-recession peak, it was, it was way high before the recession tanked, it's, it surpassed its peak. Meanwhile, compensation mm -hmm. as a share of GDP is the lowest it's been since the year I was born, which I won't tell you what it is, but it's a <laughs> lot of, many years ago, um, uh, 1955. Um, and that generates the kind of the energy and the sentiment you're saying, but the that, you know, someone said, I don't know if it's true, but I thought that kind of resonated with me. Someone said, look, and it's very broad, you know, the Tea Party is a movement of anger, Occupy Wall Street is kind of a movement of hope. I don't know, that kind of feels sort of right to me. And, and I think the, the uh, vicious anger, what I perceive, uh, this vicious anger of the Tea Party against government um, is uh, antithetical to uh, where um, uh, I envision the movement going either the movement itself, and, and, or, or as, as Dorian said, the energy that the movement's creating. Mm -hmm. So a couple of thoughts on this, and, and, and I wanna let Dr. Bernstein off the hook in one way from something he said earlier. There's a big difference between, I think, the economic conditions when the Obama administration took office from say when Franklin Roosevelt took office in 1933. Roosevelt takes office four years into the Great Depression. Wow when the reigning ideology, the reigning narrative, the reigning economic story was clearly discredited. Unemployment close to 25%. Yeah. President Obama walks in roughly four months into the Great Recession, and, and he's seen in some ways as, in terms of the handoff from GW to President Obama with TARP and some other things, he's seen as in some ways linked to the previous administration yeah. in a way in which that dominant economic narrative was never discredited. So not until, I mean, I think we have a moment right now to change the economic story, to change the economic narrative. But that's a huge difference in the constraints on an Obama versus a, a Roosevelt in terms of the broader national discourse. In terms of the, the overlap between the Tea Party and Occupy, I mean, the, the, I can't go on without talking about race here because I think when you look at when the Tea Party emerged, it wasn't even a month after the inauguration. And when you look at the signs at many of the Tea Party rallies, when you do public opinion polls and surveys of self-identified Tea Partiers, there is a link between their racial attitudes towards black people and immigrants that's different from other white folks. 
So there's, I think, a part of the Tea Party that will never have any kind of overlap with Occupy Wall Street, which seems to be a much more inclusive movement on many dimensions, including race. Having said that, there are, yes, some of the concerns and some of the anger that the Tea Party, I mean, a Tea Party in some ways is a populist movement, much like Occupy Wall Street is. And some, although the anger is misplaced, the anger isn't at corporate America, it's not at employers, it's not at Wall Street, it's at big government, which I think is also racially coded. So, so you have to, I think, separate those two things. I don't think there's much overlap, but I don't think it actually matters if there is, because I think movements always are about a minority of people taking risk to raise issues on the national agenda. So if you think about the civil rights movement, in 1960, student sit-ins began. A majority of Americans, over 60% thought that was a bad tactic and that it would make things worse. In 1961, we had the Freedom Rides. A majority of Americans thought that was a bad idea, that it would make race relations worse. It would, it, blacks were gonna not they were gonna not benefit from that tactic, right? But nobody would admit that now. We all look back on that and say, oh, we were all part of civil rights. In terms of what the, the, how many people Occupy Wall Street takes in terms of mobilizing and the tactics they use, you don't necessarily need a majority to still win the, the big fights. Well, at the risk of, of walking into a, a racial minefield here, Professor Warren, um, some of the most skeptical people that I've encountered about Occupy Wall Street are black. You know, some of my students of color who have said, hey, you know, black people have been suffering from unemployment, double digit unemployment for decades, but this didn't become an issue for the country that was salient until the privileged class, you know, began to suffer from some of this stuff. So why should I go down there now? What, what are your thoughts on that? So what? I mean, I think, I think race and black folks have always been the miner's canary in the coal mine in some ways. So I think that's partly true. I think it's partly wrong because I think when you look at black Americans' attitudes about a range of issues, unemployment, income inequality, they are the most liberal progressive voting bloc in the country. So they fully agree with Occupy Wall Street. And there, I think even if you look here in New York at Zuccotti Park, at the big marches, there have been lots of people of color involved. Discussions with uh, some of the folks is, um, is the absence of opportunity for college graduates mm -hmm. And this is a pretty shocking thing. Now, the unemployment rate for college graduates is usually fractional. It's in the 2% range. Right now, it's 4.5%. That's half of the overall rate, uh, but it's double what it usually is for college grads. I talked to a woman today who is um, extremely affluent, and um, she told me about her worries about her kids who are graduating from Ivy League school and simply have face no good employment prospects. And I found this to be um, you know, very consistent with what I've heard from lots of, of kids in that situation. And that is the breaking of not just a basic social contract, but kind of a, 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 an advanced high order social contract. Because what you were told was that, OK, it's not because you're black that you're not getting ahead. It's because you don't have a college education. Um, and, well, so it turns out that um, um, uh, African Americans with college education have double the unemployment rates of white people with college education. So there's still an element of racist there as well, racism there as well. But when you start to see that part of the, of the social contract kind of breaking down, I think the absence of opportunity there among the privileged class is very much a, an, ener uh, an energizer for the movement. Mm -hmm. um, Let's uh, kind of move from New York down to Washington and, and uh, ask a couple of questions about the White House and, and life inside the Leaving White House. Leaving behind all the good pizza and bagels. So go <laughs> ahead. Yeah, I get it. Um, in Ron Suskind's new book, Confidence Men, uh, I'm not sure if, if uh, you guys have, have read it yet, but uh, I imagine you had about 500 phone calls uh, about its contents in, you know, within 24 hours I of the I talked to him numerous times while he was okay. writing the book at, at the White House request, so I'm not telling... Any not no one knows. Here. Yeah, no, okay. no, no secrets out of school. Um, well, you know, the, I think the main thrust of the book uh, was that Larry Summers, as head of the White House uh, National Economic Council, um, as the gatekeeper for the flow of economic of information about uh, the economy towards the president, mm -hmm. severely constricted the flow of information such that the only views that, that tended to reach the president 
were those that you described as, as being characteristic of this consensus, this deregulatory consensus. Um, do you think that's an accurate assessment? I think it meant, I'm not going to answer that as directly as you'd like. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, uh, you know, personal friendships involved here, meetings that are confidential. Um, but what I will say is this. First of all, I'm not sure that's all that uncharacteristic. The president just doesn't hear as many debates as uh, he or she probably should. Um, uh, um, but um, the, the problem is less what Susskind identifies there um, and more that the folks at the top of our economic profession, I don't care who they are, and this is not naming names, I mean, when you're, when you're president, you're going to go hire the top Democratic economists. When you're a Republican president, you're going to go hire the top Republican economists. I know Mitt Romney has hired Greg Mankiw and uh, the guy from Columbia. Logan. Logan or? No, what's his name? Uh, Hubbard. Glenn Logan Hubbard has Hubbard, hired yeah. Mankiw and Hubbard. You know, that's, that's the doppelganger of the, mm -hmm. of the ones on the other side. So, um, so the, the problem is less that the president didn't hear different views than that the discipline has uh, too few views to offer. Mm. Um, so let's move a little bit from the White House to Congress and uh, the Super Committee and its failure. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, uh, <laughs> so, you know, applause for, from the applause crowd about, about the, the Super Committee's failure. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, and, and I think, uh, thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm with you. Know, because, you know, that, that I think uh, comports with the views of, of a lot in the progressive community who said that if we do, if the super committee does arrive at some type of grand bargain, then that would necessarily entail some, you know, significant changes to Medicare and or Social Security. And um, it sort of became a litmus test for a lot of progressives that we not make these adjustments to Medicare. Um, but... Any, most of the adjustments that were on the table, such as means testing, mm. uh, you know, changing the eligibility requirements to ensure that um, very wealthy people did not uh, qualify for Medicare, uh, those things that were on the table would have generally adversely affected the very wealthy. So do you think that it was wise for Democrats to make it sort of a litmus test to not touch Medicare when most of the reforms on the table would have primarily affected only the most affluent? The reforms that were on the table went too far. I, I wouldn't be absolutist about it and say there aren't things we could do that would help sustain uh, the solvency of, the, uh, of Medicare, uh, Social Security. Medicaid, I'd be very hesitant to cut a single dollar. I mean, I'm sure you can always find ways, but man, that is a bare bones program. And you live where I, I mean, even in Alexandria, you know, I know that there are literally one or two specialists who will see pe Medicaid patients in some areas. So I'd be very mm. wary of Medica Medicaid cuts. Look, there are savings that could be re realized, and some of them would be, uh, and, 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 you know, I would definitely want to generally structure them so they were, uh, so that they didn't hurt the middle and the, and the, and the lower income uh, folks, yeah. Um, Professor Warren, uh, I would guess that given your political leanings, you won't be shedding many tears if the defense budget uh, has to absorb half of the cuts uh, if, if the super committee isn't able to, uh, to arrive at an agreement. So um, is that accurate? And do you think that you know, people you know, of, of your uh, uh, views are best with, with no result, with the failure of the super committee? Yes. But um, I, just a, a, a related point, so I'm going to sort of dodge the question. What's interesting is, but for, this goes back to my first point, but for Occupy Wall Street, the one thing we would have been talking about the last two months would have been austerity, debt, deficit, super committee. And it's only in the last two weeks that we were talking about that. Instead, we've been talking about inequality, the top 1%, mm -hmm. the difference between the loss of a middle class, essentially, in this country. So I think, I think again, this is a key moment, and the question is, how do we extend the moment to have the kinds of political discussions and discourse we need to fundamentally reshape and transform American politics right now? I think this is our best chance, frankly. 
I haven't had a chance to, to, to diss the super kid in many enough. Um, uh, I found the whole process to be undemocratic. I mean, I understand that Congress voted for it, and they could vote it. They could vote down what the Supercommittee reported out. The president could veto it. I'm not saying that you know we're doing five-year plans here, but um, but I found the whole thing to be undemocratic. Henry Waxman had a rant on this uh, one day. He uh, and 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 he he, he kind of argued that there's just no transparency, I don't know what they're talking about, it's just not a democratic process, and it's completely focused on the wrong thing. If you want to have a super committee to fix a deficit, have it fix the jobs deficit. The, the budget deficit is not the problem we have right now. The budget deficit is a medium and long-term problem. The problem right now is the jobs deficit, and that's what we need to be focused on. The president actually, I, I didn't breeze through this in one of my slides, I didn't talk about it, the president actually has a good jobs plan. The American Jobs Act is pretty good. And even under discussion, I mean, you're trying, they're trying to pull out certain parts and get them through, but they're having great, great difficulty. So this really, um, this, this is a, a very salient example of it, just how poorly we understand and manage deficits and debt, not just in this country, but in, in every advanced economy right now. Both of you have, have expressed uh, optimism about the possibilities raised by the Occupy movement and how it could um, channel itself into the, the political sphere. In, in my view, if it could do one thing, it would be, you know, work towards a constitutional amendment to publicly finance all campaigns, um, all federal campaigns, because I think that would ultimately be the gateway reform to be able to uh, do so many other, you know, reforms that, uh, that I think are necessary. Do you agree that that, that would be uh, a good place to start, or do you think there's some place else that could ultimately uh, generate more impact? So, there, there are a couple ways in which Occupy could, sh could reshape American politics. So one is already happening, that's reshaping the national political discourse. Secondly is reshaping the political agenda. And I think it's gonna be interesting to watch the election cycle because whether or not Occupy gets involved or not, you can imagine at the presidential debates, the moderators raising these questions mm -hmm. and forcing both candidates, the incumbent president, as well as the Republican challenger, to answer about inequality, about all of these issues. So that's, I think that's already a win, as I said earlier. Third is, I think there are a range of structural reforms, including constitutional amendment around money and politics, a Robin Hood tax on financial transactions, for instance. I mean, there are a range of things that I think we're gonna be hearing much more about, whether or not Occupy has demands ever or not, a whole bunch of other political organizations are gonna fill that void and, be, and push a range of demands. So yes, that will be one uh, constitutional amendment that I think would be really useful. But let me back up and provide a little bit of historical context. I think of Occupy Wall Street as a populist movement, similar to populist movements in this country in the 1930s, but the original populist movement was in the 1890s. And it took off, especially after the recession of 1891, 1892, bless you. One, two of their demands, <coughs> the first one was a constitutional amendment for the direct election of senators because we didn't directly elect our senators. The second demand was a constitutional amendment to institute an income tax. Hmm. Now, this was their demand, and these are their two big demands in 1896. The populist movement was essentially over by 1901, 1902, but they ultimately won. In 1913, both of those amendments were passed, so it took 20 some odd years, and I'm not suggesting this is gonna take 20 years to fix, it might, but just to provide a bit of context, no matter, you know, Occupy has raised these issues in a way and put these, these demands on the agenda in a way that I think we now have to figure out what's our strategy to reshape the narrative to make proposals around constitutional amendments or other kinds of things, no matter how long it's gonna take. I, I agree, Jeff, uh, with your, with your uh uh, view on on public uh, public financing um, it does seem like the general drift of that problem is going the wrong way and going the other way with citizens united sure. uh, and so i'm not sure how we get there from here but when you look at just how upside down so much uh, in politics is right now um, i mean we're talking about uh, 
these deficit reduction plans that um, will admit no taxing, you know, the Grover Norquist problem, right? This is the idea that you can never, you can't possibly raise taxes. That to me is you know, very intimately connected to uh, campaign finance. Uh, and it's, it's very different than the way things used to be. If you go back and look at historical deficit reduction plans, which we've had to you know, do many times in the past three or four decades, new revenues were significant parts of the deal under Reagan, you know, under Bush, under, under, under Bush the father. Um, uh, uh, so this kind of radicalism uh, around taxes is relatively new. And the interaction between these uh, 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 hi historically almost unprecedented levels of income inequality and money in politics uh, are, are toxic. Pretty, pretty ironic, isn't it, that uh, Reagan raised taxes numerous times and also uh, the 1986 amnesty. Yeah, um, yeah. You sure wouldn't know That's it listening, right. listening to these point, debates. Yeah. He'd be kicked out of the party in a, <laughs> yeah. in a minute today. <laughs> um, well, I have... Uh, a few more questions, but why don't we open up to the audience and see if there are questions out there. Uh, that was the first. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, so there'll be mics coming around, and I know there was a question right up front here. And from the, okay. Uh, we have a basic structural unemployment in this country because we've exported our jobs, our R&D, our revenues, and many of the business functions instead of goods and services. So what would you do, if, and the issue is always jobs and revenues. Speaking so, to the mic, so we can. So what, is your, what would be your model to actually bring back jobs, specifically in the high-tech area, where we can best compete in the global economy, and even domestically, with, if we had universal health care, and uh, 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 we could do that, and compete favorably with low tech. Okay, I can answer that. Um, first of all, if uh, there, there's a, a rel uh, an estimate I saw the other day by an economist, uh, Bill Klein, who does I think nice work in international trade, who argued that if um, uh, Asian currency manipulators, China is the largest uh, uh, economy, uh, 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 but but not the only one. Uh, were to allow their currencies to appreciate. So he just for, so everyone knows what we're talking about, uh, the idea here is that um, our exports, which tend to be largely manufactured goods, where we have long uh, uh, and persistent trade deficit, large and persistent trade deficits, that's kind of what the gentleman is referring to, um, uh, the, these goods are at a competitive disadvantage because when other countries um, keep their currencies artificially low relative to the dollar, it makes our exports more expensive relative to uh, uh, goods that they're sending over here, their exports. And this guy estimated that if, if China were to allow its currency to float and be set in, in international markets instead of set where they want it to, to be, uh, the manufactured trade deficit you know, would go to zero. Now, I don't know if that's true. That sounds pretty extreme. But I suspect it would, it would go down a, a lot. And um, there are millions of jobs embedded in that trade deficit. So the first thing we should do is get our currency right. And there's actually a good bill on this. And believe it or not, it, was, it, it actually voted, it was voted out of the Senate. It got a filibuster-proof majority. Nothing gets out of the Senate. Uh, and this, this is a bill on China currency that would give the administration the authority it needs to impose countervailing duties on this kind of currency management. It's a very good bill, so we should pay attention to that. Look, I think, uh, as I said in my talk, however, I'm, uh, I, I'm all for pushing back on, on the problems you mentioned, bringing back as many jobs as we can over here. But globalization is, way, is a genie that's way out of the bottle, and manufacturing in particular is becoming more and more automated. What, one of the things I think about, and this is also in the spirit, Dean, of uh, thinking about middle and lower income people, and it's very relevant to New York City, is that if you actually look at where the jobs are going to be in the future, uh, and, 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 and you kind of think about the economy finally getting back on track, a lot of those jobs will be in the services. They'll be, I mean, the, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the occupations adding the most jobs over the next 10 years are not computer scientists and geniuses um, uh, you know, uh, writing software code. They're like home health aides, mm -hmm. and cashiers, and security guards, and food prep workers. And those, I, I grant you that those you know, may be low value added jobs, but they don't have to be terrible jobs. That, you know, a home health aide 
with uh, an associate's degree in geratology is a better home health aide than one who's only a high school graduate. A home health aide who has uh, 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 benefits from a, a robust earned income credit or a high minimum wage or guaranteed health care has a, a, a better quality job. So I wouldn't give up on the services either. How, how can you support a Let's get another question. We'll come back to you because we want to just make sure we... we uh, I want to jump in here just on, on, on Jared's point. Um, so there's one other factor that he hasn't mentioned, and that's strong unions and a strong labor movement. <laughs> and all those jobs that he just mentioned and all those occupations, unless workers have the rights to organize, the right to bargain for higher wages, they're going to stay crappy jobs. Yeah. And we've been there before. In the 1930s in manufacturing, auto workers, rubber workers, steel workers, textile workers, those were all crappy jobs that people said, oh, you've got to have more education and higher skills to make it to the middle class. And those jobs became good jobs because people made them good jobs through unions. And so in the service sector, I think we have to figure out how to do the same thing, whether it's hotel workers or hospital workers or home health aides or domestic workers figuring out how to make those jobs good jobs that give people a chance to make it to the middle class, I think is a huge, huge, huge issue. And it should be labor policy. There's a, a you'll read in the newspapers tomorrow about something that happened at the National Labor Relations Board, not very sexy, the National Labor Relations Board today, a little debate about rules that make it easier to unionize. That's a huge part of the explanation for the growing inequality the last 30 years is the sharp decline in unions. When inequality, when we were more equal, when the, we had the strongest middle class, was when we had the strongest unions. Mm -hmm. But both of you have talked, uh, have invoked history a lot in your, in your explanations for things tonight. And I've always been fascinated by just the ahistoricism, you know, of, of the polity in a lot of respects that, that just three years ago we saw what happened on Wall Street and now here MF Global is leveraged 44 to 1. And I read that that Goldman Sachs is nearly as leveraged as they were at the peak in, in 2007. Uh, how, you know, are you um, surprised by this? And do you feel that Dodd-Frank, the financial reform bill uh, in 2010, should have included more stringent requirements about leverage? I, uh, I'm not surprised because I'm used to uh, this amnesiac problem you're describing. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's uh, uh, a well-known uh, and, and, big, and big problem, and it's very much a function of everything I described, heavily leavened with the campaign finance that you were, Jeff, complaining about. And, and so, you know, what is the Upton Sinclair line? Um, uh, don't, don't count on a man to, uh, what is it? What's to understand thing? something he's paid yeah. not to understand. Yeah, don't, yeah, don't <laughs> count on someone to understand or remember history if he's paid to forget it. You know, that's, mm -hmm. that's, pretty, that's pretty, pretty obvious. Um, I'm, again, I'm interested, again, in these Republican candidates, a guy like, again, Kane to some extent, Perry to the, uh, almost wear their historical ignorance as a kind of a, 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 a as, as, you know, a, a, a badge of honor, right, a badge of honor. Like, like it's, um, you know, I'm so, uh, well, anyway, I don't need to go well, there. Uh, actually, wait, I want to say one other thing about uh, Dodd-Frank. Um, I think uh, one of the things Tim Geithner used to talk about all the time was was the importance of of of, of uh, these uh, capital uh, capital reserves, which is another way of talking about about this. The idea that of, of um, you can get a lot wrong with regular. You know, I, I think Dodd Frank is is a, is a good bill that's in danger of being uh, defanged by the process, mm -hmm. and in that sense. Um, you could argue that the bill should have decided more up front instead of leaving so many decisions to the regulatory committees. Put that aside, you can actually get a lot wrong if you get the leverage requirements right. Uh, other, it, it's, it's a great insurance uh, program against people doing exactly the kind of things that they're starting to do again, and I am worried about that. Well, I have a simple solution to it all, which is 999. <laughs> um. I wanted to make one quick point. And this is, it's startling to me. I'm surprised people aren't enraged by this. But Newt Gingrich just said last week that he thought child labor laws were stupid. Right? So that's, I mean, that's a pretty risky proposition. The notion that somehow we should go back to having kids in sweatshops in this country. Now that actually relates to the earlier question about 
the global economy? Because I think this is a really thorny issue. It is the case that we're probably not going to get a lot of manufacturing back in the U.S., but the other problem is as long as you have sweatshops all over the world where you can make cheap goods. Remember, Walmart doesn't make one thing it sells in its stores, even though it's the largest retailer on the planet, the largest employer in the U.S. It doesn't make one thing in its stores. But most of the things in its stores are made in sweatshops. So how do we deal with that problem? Because as long as the global floor is so low, American workers will never be able to compete with 13 cents an hour to make anything. I know there was a question. Uh, OK, my first, I just want to make a brief statement before I ask. Medicare and Social Security should not be means tested because it would be turning a, a middle class insurance program into a welfare program, and you would lose all middle class support for that program. So that should be totally off the table. OK, my question is that in the height of the, the, the depression, when we had the worst economy, much worse than it is today, we created Social Security, the crown jewel of government pro social insurance programs. Now, in contrast, we have a horrible economy, and the first thing Democrats and Republicans alike say, how do we cut these benefits to people, needy people, who really need these benefit, these rather meager benefits, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. Therefore, I believe that this country has become so mean-spirited because of the Ronald Reagan and the Republican Party. Therefore, don't you feel that occupied Wall Street, instead of lying around in parks, might do better to use their energy to try to defeat the Republican Party and support those candidates that um, they agree with? Because as long as there's a Republican in Congress, there isn't a, this austerity program is going to exist and it's going to destroy our economy. Well, thank you uh, for that question. I agree 100% with the latter half of your statement. I, I, I disagree respectfully with the, your initial statement. Uh, um, and I, I think that Medicaid should be absolutely off the table. But most of the proposals out there that have received any bipartisan support on Medicare would, I don't think, erode middle class support for the program because it would only isolate out people who have in retirement have incomes of about a half million dollars or more. And so, you know, I think it would be a, a reasonable step to, uh, to, to reining it in. It's very, it's, it's very few people. Yeah? Can I, you know, can I respond to the there's second a, There's a huge, yeah, one second, uh, Professor. But um, <laughs> there's, like you know, sure, um, th there's not a, a huge amount of people uh, in that population, but um, the Medicare program, as it is currently, you know, uh, operating, is not sustainable in the long term. And uh, no, that's not right. A absolutely. I mean, we have to rein in health care costs. We 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 have to. We. We. That's we, true. I, you know, I, I think it's right that, that we absolutely have huge uh, issues to address in terms of healthcare delivery and healthcare costs mm -hmm. uh, holistically. Um, and I think that we have to have an honest conversation as a country about end of life care, because right now, half of all the dollars we spend in this country on healthcare are spent in the last year of people's lives, and in many cases uh, are, are doing it that, that most doctors or citizens would agree. Uh, are, are not wise, and, and we, we can no longer afford to do that. But uh, Professor Warren, I know you wanted to save. I here. wanted to say something about the, the, what Occupy Wall Street should be doing. So first of all, you know, Mayor Bloomberg made sure they're not in the park anymore, <laughs> as did the mayor of Oakland and L.A. and mayors all over this country, Democratic mayors, by the way, mm -hmm. who are kicking them out. So that, that, that's a non-issue as of now. But more importantly than that, the critique they're raising is not a critique about the Republican Party. It's a critique about the political system and the corruption of the political system and money in politics that affects both parties. So when you look at the Democratic Party and you look at the money from Wall Street the Democratic Party takes in, the party has to make a decision. Is it going to be the party of workers in the middle class or the party of Wall Street? And you can't be both, I would argue. You can't be both. So. 
So I think the critique nonetheless about the role of money in politics and the way in which it's corrupted the system is the right critique. And the question is, what do we need to do to get the money out of politics? This goes back to our earlier discussion. So that the Democratic Party, if you're a Democrat, I'm a registered independent, so I don't have to. <laughs> but if you're a Democrat, then your party can be truer to its roots in some ways, right? But, but it's a compromised party, it's a compromised system. And that's what's on the agenda now that was not part of the political discussion two months ago. So I let me- wouldn't, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't ask Wall, Occupy Wall Street or anybody to support one party or the other because of all the problems my colleagues have mentioned with the parties. I think you got it, I, I think it gets down to cases. I work with politicians mm -hmm. uh, almost daily. This morning I was on Capitol Hill uh, at a briefing organized by Representative Rosa DeLauro mm -hmm. to promote a bill by uh, herself and, and Sherrod Brown that I guarantee you is completely consistent with everything I've been talking about mm -hmm. and the folks on this panel have mm -hmm. been talking about. And uh, I, I believe that um, you know, my, my sense of, of OWS is uh, is that it's a, 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 that, that 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 what we were talking about was again consistent with them. It's an infrastructure program to fix the public schools. Hmm. So it's really a matter of of cases, and 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 rather than arguing that someone should support it, one party or the other, I'd actually say listen to what individuals are talking about, what they stand for, the extent to which they line up with at least you know the kind of things I was trying to espouse. Uh, I think there's a question. Okay. Uh, uh, first off, I'd like to really uh, congratulate you all. Thank you for uh, for the great presentation. It's uh, been a long time that since I've heard one that's that's traveled as far and as deeply uh, uh, in such a short period of time. I think Henry Cohen would probably be very <laughs> Thank excited. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, my question goes to to I, I don't know means maybe rather than ends. I think that the the, the ends that have been portrayed are are, are very good. You know. Um, examples, uh, uh, sterling examples of uh, policy changes that need to take place. But picking up on the, uh, you can't convince somebody whose check depends on their seeing the opposite. And the 30 years or more, I don't know, I read a book that started, said it's really started back in the 30s. Um, of, of the drumbeat of, of freedom, the, the, the linkage of freedom and the personal, individual, religious, and other kinds of freedom, and a free market economy with no regulations and any infringement upon the person's ability to do anything they want in a market is an in infringement upon their kind of existential freedom. Okay, so that's that's something that's been going on for quite some time. So we have economic reasons, individual economic reasons for people not to see the obvious, at least what many of us think is factually based obvious. Mm -hmm. And we have a, an, an ideology and, and, and people who have been trained from their um, uh, uh, grade schools, if not uh, 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 college and, and so forth on, uh, in this uh, ideology. And I think it really is an ideology. And I think that uh, the presentation of how, how we can't get there from here presentation, that if you link a, a few things together is a, is a pretty consistent kind of ideological approach to the world. Do you have um, a question? Sir? So the question is this, because there's a, th that's a framework. The question is, we can have lots of facts in our, in our, in our quiver. You know, we can have zillions of facts and we can do charts and so forth. Mm -hmm. And we're very good mm -hmm. in a sense, and I say us, all right? We're, we're very good at presenting these facts. But, but the reaction and the debate in our society is a debate that almost, I mean, we talk about Newt Gingrich and child welfare laws or 999 raising taxes on 80% of the households mm -hmm. and so forth. We have a non-factually based opposition. We have people whose, whose um, uh, goal, in a in sense, I'm, I guess, you know, I'm being long-winded, I guess, uh, hmm. so apologize for it. Well, let me we stop you because I think I know where you're going. Okay. I, think you, so I think what you so want to ask, so let me ask your question for you. Okay. I think what you want to ask is how the heck do we prevail in, in a world where facts don't matter? Right. Okay. Thank you. Good question. Yeah. Dorian? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, uh, I think we have to tell the story 
uh, in a way that's uh, deeply compelling to people, and we haven't done that yet. I do believe that while facts may not uh, matter in the you know Washington debate, I hear mm. I deal with that all the time. I'm a commentator on cable television, man. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, I, uh, I, I I I tell you, people remember. For example, I say people, I mean the broad electorate, the independents who are ultimately probably going to pull the deciding lever in the next election. People remember, for example, that the Bush economy was a very bad economy. You talk about amnesia, it's absolutely true. There's a lot of amnesia, but people remember this. And what, what they haven't quite linked up is the supply side trickle down rational expectations to precisely that um, uh, Bush economy and the playbook that conservatives are playing out of right now. So we have to help them connect those dots. And I don't think we can do it with charts of inflation adjusted dollars. I think the model might be more, uh, I, I've been thinking lately about Al, Al Gore's movie about an inconvenient truth. Now, that's in a way it's a weird example because it's not like we've gotten anywhere on climate change either. <laughs> but I think we need some kind of a production. If you see this movie Inside Job, you yeah. get a real feel for what went on. And if enough people saw that, I have a feeling it would help. I think there needs to be a production, a high quality production about these issues. And it can't be made by me or Jeff or Dorian. It has to be like James Cameron or something, <laughs> um, uh, you know, starring, you know, um, uh, Angelina Jolie. Be my, and I'd be happy to work with her on, uh, on any of the, you know, difficult parts. Uh, but it, no, I'm, I'm, I, but that's what I think is needed. Something that kind of grips people more. Yeah. And I I, we definitely have to change the narrative. I mean, one way, one thing we could say is to people, hey, uh, you're falling out of the middle class if you are middle class. How the last administration work out for you? Or, or even better, how the last 30 years work out for you of this experiment in free market ideology? How, how's that going for you? Mm -hmm. but, then, yeah. but then I think we do need an aspirational story mm -hmm. about what we could do, what kind of economy we could create, mm -hmm. that we've done it before, we've done it before, we could do it again. Yeah. What's the aspirational story and narrative we can offer people? Yeah. Again, the, the facts and charts aren't gonna work for most people. And It'll work for some of us, but, but we need an, a story I, that's hopeful as well. Yeah, and I think, to your point, Jared, we need to be, I think, you know, uh, more talented in the way we frame things, and maybe that's a movie. We also need to be more concise in the way that, you know, the other side has been more concise. In a past life, I was a public servant advocating for public financing of campaigns. My opponents always said, so you want me to pay for these terrible negative campaigns? And that was powerful until I figured out how to say, do you feel like three, $3.20 in a year would be a small price to pay to have your democracy back? <laughs> and no lobbyists at all, and people are like, huh. So I just feel like, you know, longer, yes, and, sh and shorter. Crisper, yeah. Last question, right there. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Denise. Yes, hi. Um, so there seems to be a political incentive for the Republican Party specifically uh, to keep the middle and working class in distress through Election Day, um, mm. which freaks me out, and I want to know what the panel thinks can be done about that. We've got a Jobs Act sort of on the table, but who's going to pass it if it means that President Obama's doing a good job and he's more likely to be elected, reelected? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's almost, uh, it's amazing to think that the Senate minority leader said publicly for people to hear, our top priority for the next two years is beating Barack Obama. Uh, to have someone so brazenly talk politics yeah. in a time of near double digit unemployment is you know appalling you know but uh, I think speaks to, to the wisdom of your question Jared it's going to be a very ugly year Denise uh, there's no good answer uh, to that question the president is going to do everything he can to improve the economy uh, through executive order and administrative rule changes that don't involve the Congress. And there's some things you can do, but almost none of them move the needle very much on unemployment because you need the purse strings for that. The only area where there might be some traction is in some housing ideas that the administration is going to espouse, but it's nothing you could run a campaign on. You know, we, we're trying to get the banks to cooperate on refis. You know, it doesn't meet Jeff's criteria of a quick thing that actually connects with people. So I, I, I'm quite worried about this, uh, and, and I very much like Dorian's admonition to 
build an aspirational story uh, to, and part of that has to be um, look at what they're doing, look at what Mitch McConnell said, mm -hmm. look at the extent to which these uh, uh, guys are willing to throw the economy under the bus for their political gain. I'm seeing it happen right now mm -hmm. uh, with the jobs plan. I certainly saw it in the debt ceiling debate, a willingness to, to inflict a deep, deep self-inflicted wound on the economy of this nation uh, for, uh, uh, for, political, for political gain. Um, so, uh, but, but, you know, what I worry about is that um, the next year is just going to be, um, what I, uh, is just going to be ugly mudslinging. And, and, and I think Gorian's right. You need, there needs to be aspiration too. It can't just be, um, you know, vote for me because the other side is nuts. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, I'm not them. Mm -hmm. It's got to be something more. There's got to be an aspirational story in there. And that's, 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 that's much harder when you're in the incumbent for four years and than when you're new. Can the president, you know, uh, find that again, that spark that he had? That yes, I think so. I mean, he's actually, it, it's not well reported, but he is traversing the country. I think he was in New York today, in fact. Um, he's traversing the country, trying to do, I think, exactly that. He's, and he's, and he, he's, he's good at it, not because he's a skilled politician, he may or may not be, but he really does have a, have a progressive, hopeful vision. He still has that. He hasn't lost it. And I think we're going to hear a lot more about that. I sure hope we do. Doran, we'll give you the last word. It'll be a depressing word, so no. Uh, okay, well, we'll we don't have to. back to you. But, but <laughs> this, this is, you know, th here's a likely scenario. President Obama could win re-election, but the Senate and the House are, Repu are Republican, right? And uh, I think... Tw 23, 20, they have, you, we have 23 seats in the Senate up, and they only have 11 up. Right. And the seats that we have up are in, like, North Dakota and Nebraska and in some of the most, in the reddest states in the country. Mm. So it's very, that's one likely scenario, which is not very hopeful. Like if we think the last couple of years have been rough? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So what this means though is, I do think, I'm trying to be aspirational here. I do think <laughs> this is a good moment for all of us to take advantage of the change in discourse and discussion and debate that's happening right now. And the question is, yes, I'm not going to go down and sleep in Zuccotti Park anywhere else, mm -hmm. but I could do other things, right? So the question is, what are we all going to do? What actions are we going to take in the next year? Who are we going to talk to and try to tell a different story and narrative in the next year? What family members and strangers alike are we going to talk to about? What can we do to try to shift this? So, so that's, that's where I would leave it, is to figure out individually and collectively, how can we drive this moment to be much, much longer than a moment, but could be a generation of change? We well, couldn't have left it better in the spirit of, of Milano. So thank you very much. <laughs>